Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our distinguished guests. Nila Tazi, CEO of A3, Moroccan Senator, President of the Federation of Cultural Industries of Morocco. Obi Asika, Founder and Chairman of Dragon Africa. Peace Hyde, Creator and Executive Producer, Netflix, Ghana. George Kachara, Chairman and Founder, Heva Fund, LLP. Valerie Carventura, Founder of Africa Fashion Up. Our discussion will be moderated by Claudine Moore, Managing Director, Allison. So, good, good afternoon, hello, and bonjour. I'm afraid bonjour is as, much as, is as much French as I know. So I've given you all the French, but I'm very excited to be here in this beautiful city of Marrakesh with you all. I know this is the very last day of what has been an exceptional three-day forum. And uh, I'm very excited to be not only doing the last closing plenary session, but also to be doing a session on Africa's creative industries. As you heard, my name is Claudine Moore. I am part of their MTP team here that has been moderating a series of, a series of sessions during the forum. Um, I'm also a professor at NYU, teaching corporate social responsibility and global engagement. And as you heard, I'm the managing director, um, PR and communications, focusing on African markets for just under 15 years. Um, Africa's creative industries are one of our most visible sectors. We are essentially sharing not only ourselves, but our culture with the world, whether it's by film, literature, fashion, food, music, and more. We are heavily influencing not only how we see ourselves, but how the world sees Africa and Africans. There was a recent CNN headline that said, and I'll quote, content is the new crude oil. And that really shows how critical content is to creative industries globally. But in the Africa context, that really shows and highlights the Africa's creative industries, in particular, how huge the potential is to drive economic development and growth through job creation. I am delighted, I'm gonna take a seat now, but I'm delighted to have a panel, an exceptional panel, um, of some of Africa's, not some of Africa's, Africa's leading, um, leading figures when it comes to the Africa creative industries. They're leading not only with raw talent, but they're leading in terms of being extraordinary visionaries. In addition to being extraordinary visionaries, they are leading with innovation, huge vision, innovation, and passion and determination. So you heard their names as they each were introduced to the stage. And we do have, I will, I will just remind everybody, we do have Obi Asika who will be joining us remotely. He's actually sick, but like a, like a true Nigerian, he is rallying from his sick bed or his sick office, but he is rallying to join us today. So Obi will be joining us remotely. But what I would love um, before we begin this panel is if each of our panelists could each introduce themselves very briefly, let us know what they do and who they are. We'll start with Myla. Hello, uh, good evening everyone. Good evening Claudine and to our honorable speakers and thank you to the bank, African Development Bank for the invitation to talk here. My name is Neila Tazi, I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I have a communication and PR agency events organization and I also chair the Federation of Cultural and Creative Industries that is rooted in the employers association called the CGOM in Morocco that represents the private sector. So we've been advocating for cultural and creative industries since 2017. And I also am a member of the Moroccan parliament, a senator, and I also advocate in the Senate on the legislation globally and more specifically for culture because I really want to get involved in the development of culture and creative industries. Thank you. Thank you. Peace. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Peace Hyde. I'm a media entrepreneur. Um, I am the creator and, well, co-creator and executive producer of Young, Famous and African, which is the first unscripted original uh, commissioned by Netflix for Africa. I'm also the head of <coughs> media and partnerships for Forbes Africa. Um, and I'm all 
about telling positive African stories and really sharing the excellence of the African continent and its people to the global arena. Thank you. My name is George Gashara, and I'm very happy to be here. <clears throat> I, I love Marrakesh, so uh, keep inviting me. <laughs> I am the founder of Heva Fun, um, which is a dedicated finance facility uh, for culture and creative industries that has um, since uh, invested in over 100 uh, creative businesses across 14 countries in Eastern Africa, from film, music, fashion, restaurants, wellness. Um, and we think that this is a great year and a great season for culture and creative industries, and particularly because um, banks and governments, and especially AFDB, is uh, demonstrating um, they're putting their money where their mouth is. And um, thank you. Thank you. Valerie? Bonjour, je suis Valérie Ka, fondatrice de Cher Africa et d'Africa Fashion Up. This is a foundation that was created with the with a view to highlighting uh, and to promoting youth, African youth, through creativity, fashion, the fashion industry. And we've been doing this since 2020, and each year we uh, 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 try to promote uh, young entrepreneurs, creators, fashion creators in particular, uh, to promote their brands. Hey everybody, um, can you hear me? Obi, we're very impressed that you're still joining us from your sick bed. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can okay, you hear us? Fine. Yes, I can. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Obi Asika, um, convener of the Omniverse, which is a youth collaboration platform. I executive producer for film, television, music for the last 30 odd years in Nigeria and around the continent, um, including brands such as Big Brother in Nigeria, conferences such as Social Media Week Lagos, and also very much associated with the growth and global expansion of Afrobeats. It's a pleasure to be here. Wish I was there for real. Okay, great. So now we've had Edwidi introduce themselves. Um, we'll start with some questions. Nyla, we'll start with you. So in your role as, um, and tell me if I've got this right, as the president of the Federation of Cultural Industries of Morocco, can you share how Morocco is leveraging your cultural assets to not only enhance Morocco's global cultural influence, but really boost economic growth? And, share the, and can you share some opportunities and challenges? Well, thank you for this very important question because we all are witnessing the emerging sector. Cultural and creative industries have become uh, a sector that is going to create a lot of jobs in the future. And now we see that globally, and I will talk about this vision to come and focus then on Morocco, now we are talking about the the potential of this sector. We know that in the world it's like three, two trillion dollars, mm -hmm. and only 3% of that is benefiting to Africa. And we in Morocco know that we have a big potential and that we have to bring, to, and to, to totally transform the ecosystem, the framework in which we work in, and to promote entrepreneurship. Because like in the African country and everywhere, in Morocco, we have huge potential in terms of culture, cultural expressions in all means, mm -hmm. uh, cinema, um, ed 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 editing, books, uh, uh, music, of course, and this is what the potential is huge, and it's not the one that we're working, that we're doing the best song, we have a lot of work to do, but there is an awareness now. There is, everybody is really aware that this sector is going to bring a lot of growth in our territories, in our cities, and a lot, it's gonna create a lot of jobs for future generations. So we have talent, we have patrimony, we have a huge patrimony. We did a lot of work with UNESCO, but it's not enough to just register an element at UNESCO. What do you do after that? Right. To create a whole value chain that will make it a real experience for the people of Morocco but also for the people who are going to visit Morocco. Right. And now we know that 60% of the tourists who come to Morocco come for a cultural offer. So we have to improve it. We have to make it better. We have to work on how to create value change and to make evolve the public policy, the legislation, the taxation, and everything that can bring a new dynamic and turn this potential into something concrete in terms of growth 
creating jobs and making our economy stronger because this is the challenge for our countries yeah. in the continent, how to create jobs for the new generations. And we all know that this uh, field is very attractive for the young generations. Yeah. We see more and more talents, more and more young people want to go into the, uh, the sector of culture, of creative industries, fashion, music, cinema. And we see also with the evolution of the digital economy, with the new tools we have, that we can succeed anywhere in the world as far as you've got talent and you have an ecosystem that can allow you to succeed. And we see that with Netflix, for example, and we see that on the platforms because we see more and more uh, talents and movie directors from the southern countries that succeed worldwide now and that are recognized and even uh, that win prizes in, in, in worldwide famous festivals. So this is something that is becoming more and more evident and more and more obvious for our decision makers politically in terms of economics and politic, the political decisions. So can this you, is globally what is happening in Morocco. Can you, can you speak very, very um, briefly, if you could, about any specific initiatives, very specific initiatives that um, you're working on now and, and how it is contributing? So we are working on the definition of what is the cultural and creative industry sector. This is okay. the talk we have. As, as president of the Federation of Cultural and Creative Industries, representing the private sector, we are encouraging more and more talents to go and work as private companies. And we are working with the government on how to define what is the cultural and creative sector. Because from a country to another, there are differences. And each country, taking into consideration its vision of how to create convergence between sectors also. We are working on the definition of what is the cultural and creative sector so we can improve the policies, improve the legislations, improve also the taxation, and bring more and more talents to, 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 to succeed, yeah. simply to succeed. But this is a real public-private partnership. Yeah. There has to be this dialogue between the private sector in the public in the public sector and it's interesting that that you say that you're starting with um defining what is the culture cultural and creative sectors because whilst that sounds so simple it's critical so that everybody is aware and everybody is aligned on exactly what we're talking about and exactly what the sector is and it also not only what the sector is but what the sector is not as well and I think it's important. That's actually really, it sounds so simple, but it's actually very Yes, because very if you want to drive to some, start, to start. some policies towards yes. some specific companies, you have to identify them. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. Um, so you mentioned Netflix, which beautifully brings me on to, um, to peace. So you are, as you mentioned, uh, the executive producer of Young, Famous and African. I'm a fan, and I'm sure we've got lots of fans of Young, Famous and African here. Um, and more recently, and I don't know if anybody um, in your audience has, has um, watched this, but more recently, The Black Book, it debuted um, on Netflix to staggering record-breaking numbers. I'll just give some of those, I'll share some of those numbers with the audience. So Black Book, which is a thriller um, uh, based in Nigeria, and within its first uh, 48 hours, it garnered just under 6 million views. And within less than two weeks, it peaked at number three globally. And the beauty about the Black Book, why I cite that before um, I'd like Peace to speak, to speak to, to the, um, the film sector, is um, the Black Book was made by Nigerians, it was funded by Nigerians, and much like Young, Famous and African, it's been a massive global hit. So we, we made it for ourselves, but it's, it's been a hit with us, with the diaspora, and it's been a hit globally. So Peace, why is this good for Africa? And, it, and in addition to why is this good for Africa, do you think we're witnessing African content becoming a staple part of global content? Or am, I, or am I going a bit too far? And if you do see that as a trajectory, what are the resources, initiatives needed to get us there? Um, well, first of all, I'd like to say congratulations to the creators and producers of Black Book. It was really exciting um, to see them following the young, famous African footsteps 
when we launched three years ago, um, everyone was a bit confused as to what Young, Famous and African would mean, because one of the biggest things that we were trying to do is demonstrate a different African narrative that was more contemporary and more true to the modern African that we're seeing today through the likes of our culture that is being embraced globally with the likes of a burner boy or a whiz kid that is not showing the traditional African that you may have grown up to be accustomed to, but now a new African. Um, with the success of Young Famous in African, which has been really mind blowing for us, for the creator, for the team, for the cast, and most importantly, I believe our own people. Um, it's been really exciting to be able to demonstrate a new Africa rising. And I think that demonstrates that there is a hungry audience for authenticity. And that is what we are representing now. Um, by God's grace, we've all been raised with the morals and values of what it means to be a traditional African. But now we have a new wave that is combining it with a temp contemporary modern twist. And I think we're seeing it in our new music where you have Burner Boy who's heavily influenced by Fela, but he's brought his own spin. And so everybody is welcoming that authenticity, that new type of conversation around Africa. And what I love is we're being able to demonstrate that now on a global scale with partnering with these platforms and able to push that message that it's cool to be African, yeah. it's sexy to be African. We still hold all our traditional qualities and values, but now there's a new conversation around us. And I think that's why a lot of people are welcoming us in. In terms of the opportunities that that creates, and I would like to say, it's, it's interesting. I love that you said that it's cool to be African because we've always known it's been cool to be African. Yes, we've, of we've always known it's been cool to be African. Just up. Other people didn't know it's cool to be African, so other people are catching up with us. And I, and I love that you said that because it's so true. So please continue. I think one of the most exciting things that I'm seeing with the growth of our creative economy in Africa is that now the world is actually starting to see it as something that we can invest in. So while we have brilliant agendas where our African roots are producing, creating, and sharing our content with the world, such as Black Book, we also have entities like ourselves that have partnered with these global Fortune 500 companies to be able to sell our stories and project our narrative and give our own African creators and talent the opportunity to represent themselves on a global scale. And what that's been able to do, which a lot of people don't realize, is in our first season, we're currently shooting season three, but in our first season of Young Famous and African, it was actually shot in the core of the pandemic, where right. a lot of people were losing their lives, God rest their soul. You had a lot of um, trauma really happening globally. But Young Famous and African was able to provide over 150 people jobs, opportunities, investment, um, and a way to almost protect themselves in such a day dicey time. And so I think that being able to invest and strengthen the African economy, the creative African economy, means that the more the world takes note of what Africa is producing with our raw talent, our grit, our skill, our tenacity, they're also empowering us as Africans. Yes. Whether it's coming from within or it's from the diaspora through partnerships or international um, or foreign investment. When you had the division piece uh, for young African, young, famous and African, did you envisage how huge or, 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 or did you envisage how hugely popular it was going to be with global audiences or did you say well that would be great but i want us to like it first um i think my the co why young famous and african was actually co-created by myself and my co-creator martin asari amankwa yeah. and we sat together and we really um we had relocated from london and we're living in Africa, experiencing a different type of Africa that we were projected and sold to really <laughs> in the West. And we yeah. were like, how do we get the rest of the world see. to see how incredible this new Africa is? Because although we have such a strong cultural roots and brilliant traditions that we embrace fully, there's a new Africa that people don't seem to realize exists. Um, and we see glimpses of it in the music videos and in the, the way in which our new generation of African ambassadors to the world are carrying themselves. But what if we just showed them a real world where these Africans exist, they live and they thrive? And that was really our goal. Um, we had no really plans of how big we wanted it to be, but we believe that it was the power was in our authenticity. And I think that is the power that we hold as Africans, being authentic being genuine, being sincere and truthful with our, with our stories and our realities. And so when we got together this excellent group of young Africans that were unapologetically real, not trying to be perfect or trying to kind of toe our cultural line, but were unapologetically themselves, 
we didn't anticipate how big a reaction would have, but we were very excited to see, you know, it was number three in the US for yeah. many weeks. Um, it was a trendy show on Netflix and we were, we were looking at each other like, what do we do now? <laughs> um, but it's gone from strength to strength. Yeah. We're now currently in season three, currently being shot. Um, and I'm really excited with the reception, but more importantly, I'm really excited for what this means for African creatives, yeah. for the power that is growing in our creative economy. And I'm hoping that other Africans are seeing us follow these audacious, um, not necessarily conventional routes, and saying that maybe I also have a story to tell that doesn't look like anything we're used to seeing, but is going to show people a new version of Africa, because we are also expanding. The same way we celebrate AI, technology, and all the like in the diaspora, Africa is extremely aggressively evolving. And to be African is a constantly fast-moving thing that most people are not really noticing until you plug in. And so I'm really excited to see what the future of that means for content creation, for the different sectors, and also most importantly for our creative economy and for Africans. Yeah, that's, that's great. You, um, you mentioned music, actually, which brings me, and I think if we can, uh, if Obi could have joined us um, remotely as we're talking about music, um, so, and, and just, just like some couple of statistics that I think I'd like to share with the audience. Um, the continent's streaming on demand video, known as SVOD for those in the industry, the streaming on demand market is expected to uh, reach a robust 18 million subscribers, which is up from 8 million just this year. Um, and that's according to recent research. And what I'd like, um, if Obi could join us is, um, what does what does what do you think, Obi, about the growth trajectories like this in the creative industries, and how this can be harnessed from your perspective, and as and as Peace was um, speaking to, how this can be harnessed for a, a broader contribution to DDP, and I and I and I point to Obi um, because I know Obi, you, you were instrumental in bringing um, Afrobeats to the world. I don't know, did you create that hashtag, Obi, Afrobeats to the world? You maybe did. Um, but yeah, I know that you were instrumental in bringing African music industry to the world. We all know it's, it's surging in popularity. Um, and, and just another quick, quick statistic, um, African music industry is expanding so much that within the next 18 months, that's 18 months, digital music streaming revenue is projected to reach half a billion, or just over half a billion by, by beginning of 2025. So, go, so Obi, can you speak to what all this means um, and how this can be harnessed as Peace uh, touched upon for GDP and what do you see some of the current challenges as being and how we can, how we can circumnavigate them? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, first of all, just to say Peace, well done. I haven't seen her for a while. Congratulations on everything she's doing. Um, I think one of the key things is that with, the, with Nigerian music and the explosion that you're seeing, it, 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 it came through, it, it, it seems, now it seems like it was overnight, but it's a 20 year journey over the last 20 years, which first of all, organically came through working with the big media platforms such as Mag DSTV, Africa Magic, Channel O, MTV Base. These are the early sort of people that are supporting and pushing it across the channel. Afrobeats took Africa first, and then it sort of, as it came into the UK and then into the States, it came with all the Africans who already acquired all that sort of support base. In terms of the numbers you were talking about, in terms of um, streaming numbers, I mean, I don't know if you know, but Spotify put out a big report this year that shows that just on Spotify alone, Afrobeats already, I think in 2023, we've already done 15 billion streams this year, with about 1.3 billion streams a month. And you're going to see about the same sort of numbers on Apple Music as well. And there are other big African platforms, and that's where I was about to come to, Ndondo, which is out of Kenya, um, Audio Mag is not African, but it's an ad-free platform. But I'm very interested in us seeing more domestic platforms. When you talk about GDP, to retain intent and content and re revenue, but it needs to be on domestic platforms. The biggest platform in Africa is actually YouTube. And of course, we don't own that. Um, but the truth of the matter is that new technology has disrupted all these industries and allowed us, who didn't have the budget, because you have to understand where we're coming from, except for people like George, there are very few people on the continent that have consistently backed and financed the creative industries or African IP, or had the confidence to believe in our IP to the extent to get behind it. So behind, beyond the sort of small starters, the, the smaller entrepreneurs, we haven't seen that ground swell of, of work, but although I think we're coming to that period now. So the, the, where we're going now, what we wanna see is more African nations invest and support and follow the, the example people like George are putting down of 
investing in domestic platforms that enable people to be able to push out their content and their product and monetize. Now, on the continent, of course, we have a purchasing power issue. We have some of these issues, but with the AFTCA and the amount of content that Africans generate, um, generate you have to understand that Africans are like black Americans. Obviously, we're first cousins, African Americans. The key issue is we innovate on all these platforms. So whether the platform is Pinterest or TikTok or yeah. Instagram or YouTube, the African is using it, using it in a unique way. We're bringing it to life in a unique way, and that's the way in which they're monetizing, pushing out their content. If we fix our domestic free-to-air television markets, which is around audience measurement, and we fix the simple idea of understanding that IP is the most important thing in terms of using, utilizing IP as collateral, so that African creators, innovators, can get bags from African banks without being asked for their grandmothers as collateral or their daughters in the village. And then we can understand that if you look at California, which is probably the, in the top five economies in the world, two, the two biggest elements of their economy are Silicon Valley and Hollywood, which obviously, which obviously are, which obviously are driven by IP, right? So IP is the key issue that if African nations and Africa wants to really see massive growth, Let's not wait until Disney comes and monetizes our IP. Let's invest in our IP. Let's back the innovators and let's back the creators and the original thinkers. And I think that you'll find that unlike, you know, Thor and Shango is something I talk about a lot. And I would be, I love a situation where Shango is not broke outside Lagos, but is actually a hundred billion dollar franchise the way he should be in 2023. Thank you, Obi. And we're going to, um, Get to George and speak about IP as well, actually, and and the the importance of that. But before we do, I'm going to shift gears slightly from film and music, and we're going to shift gears to fashion. So I have a question, um, a couple of questions actually, for Valerie. Um, and I know Valerie, is oui. your translations working for you, Valerie? Ça marche. Je vous entends très bien. I hear you very well. I don't have any translation. <laughs> Okay. Can you hear us, ma'am? Okay, wonderful. Okay, bonjour, Valerie. Bonjour. To shift gears, as I mentioned, and we're going to speak to uh, fashion and art. So, just a few months ago, um, during Unger, and any of you who were in New York for the United General um, Assembly just in September, when you walked down Fifth Avenue, you would be struck that in Saks on Fifth Avenue, the window in Saks, it was a complete, not only display, but almost a homage to African fashion and African fashion designers. And then in addition to that, recently in the Brooklyn Museum, and I'm providing New York examples, the US examples, just because that's where, that's just what comes to mind as, I, as I'm currently there, but the Brooklyn Museum just hosted and just closed actually an incredible, African fashion exhibit following in the footsteps of the V&A Museum in London. And so what we're really seeing is that you're seeing these hugely popular exhibits, popular with us, with the diaspora, but popular with global audiences as well. So the African fashion industry is really growing in not only visibility, but also in influence in really extraordinary ways. So um, Valerie, I'd love to speak um, for you to speak to what are your thoughts on the current surge in both the interest and visibility on the Af of the African fashion industry? Well, I've, I believe there's been a quantum leap uh, in uh, interest uh, for uh, African fashion. Museums re represent uh, what's happening in uh, African creativity with our uh, our association, we try to identify young creators are from across the world, and these creators are uh, really have no uh, co inferiority complex. On the contrary, are on the cutting edge of fashion and have a very modern know-how and of their craft, and which shows in their work. And I think that today these young creators and uh, African creativity it needs even more visibility than the option of having 
exhibit which showcase their know-how their knowledge uh, is a fantastic result and fantastic opportunity for these young people to showcase african creativity throughout the world and i think we should continue to support such initiatives and show our support for creativity by investing in the field and finding companies that are willing to come in the field here in africa and help them develop their brand. And, and I, I love, Valerie, when you mention uh, that there is no inferiority complex. There should never have been inferiority complex in the first place. But however, we know that there is for uh, historical reasons. But that, that's actually true. I, you know, the, the leaders at the forefront of the creative industries, au contraire to having any kind of inferiority complex, if anything, it's a superiority complex, knowing that our creativity, as Peace mentioned, our authenticity and our sincerity and our genuine, excuse me, our genuine innovation is what leads with us. So what I'd like to and continue with Valerie is to ask, um, are you working with Valerie or do you see any particular initiatives that you see that you're personally working on or that you see others working on that are really um, providing resources, skills or training to young people, young Africans, in fashion and art? I think, yes, there's a rising number of such initiatives. Uh, the most practical example that I can give is when we do a call to tender for young who, people from throughout the world. Throughout the world, we realize there are many organizations in Africa. We have some, a, a laureate who worked with a cooperative in Nigeria this cooperative provides employment for women and uh, families who survived the Biafra war and they are the ones who will be produce the cloth the fabric who have an artisanal know-how that ha that can only be found in Africa and I believe that uh, this uh, capacity to showcase sh such young creators each in their field and with their own identity, have it's their own way of presenting their work, be it the cloth, the fabric, the finished products which are presented by these creators, where you realize that they have a mix, a really high level, that they are absolutely ready to work abroad in the West. And what we're trying to do with organizations in Europe, we have partners, such as Balenciaga or Gallery de Lafayette or the HEC School in Paris, which will showcase their work, present their collection, and also provide them with a pathway that will allow them to meet uh, heads of businesses, to exchange through conferences that are organized with the HEC School or Sciences Po School in France to meet uh, industrialists and entrepreneurs as we have a lot of young creators in Africa who are almost all self-taught, have little diplomas, and this know-how, they have it. It's innate, innate, sorry. But how do we move from that stage to the stage of a company? And that's also what we're trying to focus. So the support that we have from a company such as Balenciaga, who join our program so as to create their catwalk shows and will then enjoy some mentoring, some training. They'll be followed over four or five months. This is the partnership with HEC, um, the High School of Economics in Paris that will help them with uh, marketing and things that they're not necessarily well equipped with. And these tools, these platform of excellence will truly help them to develop their brand. It's very crucial. It's absolutely crucial to have partnerships with people who are well versed in this uh, specific industry so that we can see uh, African brands uh, rising to the level of uh, Western or European brand. Oh, Valerie, no, this is great because you're talking about partnerships and you're talking, um, and when we're talking about partnerships, uh, that really leads me beautifully to George. And uh, that's why I wanted to just pause you there.
because everything that we've spoken about, like Ob that Obi has spoken about, Nyla has spoken about peace, and you've spoken about Valerie, um, all of this requires investment, it requires funding, it requires further resources, and as you were saying, it requires public-private partnerships. So with that in mind, what initiatives, um, George, specifically for you, so what initiatives, um, what can you speak about that the work that you are doing to invest and fund Africa's creative industries? And what more do you think institutions and governments and investors can do to fuel continued growth and um, scale, growth, scale and innovation? Thank you. Thank you for um, a rather wide question but we are in good company of bankers and Well, that's exactly makers. why I asked the question for you, George. <laughs> Now's your moment. <laughs> um, I'd like to start by acknowledging a few um, realities. And these realities uh, are not contested anymore. That culture and creative industries are the industries of the continent, that the industries of the young people in this continent. And why do I say that? That we know the Banner Boys, we know the Wiz Kids, we know the Ladumas, but be, be, beneath these um, stars that we celebrate and we enjoy, there's countless of founders and business people and creatives in every market and township of the continent mm and I've been around. These are the people who are the first investors in culture and creative industries. Yeah. Because they take their savings, they take their family monies, and they take uh, courage to start an initiative, whether it's in fashion, whether it's in wellness, whether it's in cuisine. And so everything we are talking about as culture and creative industries is really an industry sponsored by young people. So really, the challenge that we are addressing today is a challenge of underinvestment. Underinvestment sounds like this, that after the first initial surge that a young person has elected to craft, to carve, to sew, and to present a product, there needs to be an intermediary that meets them either with skills, market opportunity, uh, commercial uh, investment, or just um, strategy. And this is what uh, is the principal question of my work. For the last 10 years, uh, before this moment, I used to run a film company a fashion brand, and a little radio station off of Nairobi. We had some audience, we would get some revenues, but we needed to grow. But the banks and everyone around was skeptical. And so there was money in the ecosystem, but it wasn't money aligned or available for the kind of production that young people can with the skills and the patrimony and the capacities that they have. And so we were challenged, I was challenged to create the solution. And so 10 years later, I've invested in 100 businesses and I've moved over $10 million uh, in small companies, medium companies, that are now what East Africa is about. If you want to think about the best fashion brands, I probably have invested in them in one way or another, the theater companies and so on and so forth. So this is really the model that while we are interested in getting a, a Netflix size company uh, or American businesses to come and set, set up in Africa, there has to be a significant commitment to moving entrepreneurs and sophisticating them through uh, aligned capital. So what is aligned capital? Um, agriculture finance won't do it for creative industries. Infrastructure <laughs> finance won't do it. So what will do it? A young lady who does uh, events, let's say live music off of Mozambique, her major challenge is that for her to put up a calendar of events, 
in her country, she will need venues, she will need to confirm uh, artists well in advance, she will need to get security, she will need to get all these things in place before she announces the calendar. Nobody, nobody in our current financial ecosystem in the continent is willing to meet this lady and tell her that for your calendar, if you will gross 300,000, we can put in 100,000 uh, as, 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 as equity and share in the returns as we grow. So I challenge uh, financial institutions to start considering moving beyond statements and investing in understanding and developing products for those that are already have identified that they are entrepreneurs. But there are countless others who haven't identified but they desire. Those require public programs, public programs in learning. Uh, they want to be amateurs. They need uh, studios that are subsidized. They need a regulative environment that allows them to experiment and to experiment safely. And finally, when these two are available, the retail uh, investors and the public investors, then now we have amazing environment to bring the big guys who say they want to invest a million dollars in one business, two million dollars in one season. But we're, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit frustrated that a lot of big companies and banks want the big tickets. They want to find the ready businesses to take them to market. Those are amazing, but the real work is building ground up, and that's the work that we've been doing for the last uh, decade. Thank you. I'm, I'm so glad that that's where you sort of um, ended your, your comments, um, George, because, um, and this is an open question to the, to the panelists, all the panelists, so feel free to answer it well. I know nearly been making furious notes, so maybe you can start. But uh, there is a lot to be said about African governments who, who safeguard their creative industries through legislation, which is what I hear you saying, George, and Obi alluded to, to that earlier. And by safeguarding creative, le creative industries through legislation, this will invariably ensure that their economies are strengthened by this dynamic and growing sector, right? That's, that, that's inevitable. So what, this is an open question to all the panelists. Um, what can African governments and institutions do, do like sort of tangible tactics? What can, that, what can be done to create an even more supportive ecosystem for creative industries to thrive? And this, may, this real response may look like existing initiatives that you already know, or a wish list, a wish list of legislation or initiatives that you would wish to, to see. We'll start with you, Raina. Well, I, being very optimistic, of course, because we're here talking about this in this important African forum, after talking about the same subject during the annual assemblies of the World Bank in October here in Marrakesh, which was a premiere with the International Finance Corporation. So it means that there is awareness of the potential of this sector. But still, we realize that it's not totally understood because it when we talk about creative industry and culture, it's always the last subject in the program, in the news, in the forums, in every rendezvous, in every moment we have the opportunity to talk about various topics, culture and creative industry is always the last one. I think we should have the courage to scale it up in the mentalities. So if we scale it up in the mentalities, it will scale up in everything that will be done globally to because yeah. this sector is part of the solution in this people have to understand it the decision makers and well, i happen to be also a legislator as a senator and i know that the solution is really also in the way of bringing more and more and more and more awareness and this is in the hands of our decision makers because I've experienced this. I want to say that I, I'm, I'm an African citizen. I started the music festival. Our friend Obi is here, he's listening. We have started a festival in, uh, in a city called Isawira and about an African sub-Saharan musical heritage we had. And we brought musicians from all over the world to meet and make fusions with these African musicians. They're called the Gnawa 
music musicians. And in the beginning, when we started talking about this, nobody believed in this, in this project. No, very few people thought it would be something important or interesting. 25 years later, we have managed to totally transform the economy of the city. And the city has become one of the most important touristic destination of Morocco. And the economy of the city is all about culture and music. Yeah. And this, to give you numbers, because numbers talk, yeah. for every dirham or euro we invest in the organization of the festival, it's 17 euros or dirhams that are directly injected in the economy of the city. So you can imagine the impact, the economic impact, not talking about the, the media impact and the, the, all, all the global, uh, how do you say, promotion that is being made through a cultural event for a country and for a city. And I can tell you how many jobs have been created yeah. to, uh, around this event. The problem now is, as George said, we have to be aware of that and to transform these opportunities into reality and to find a way in the solutions to bring more finance, more money to invest in those and those companies that don't need a lot of money, but there are a lot of talents that need that little amount of money. And also, we have to have uh, training programs because we have a lot of opportunities for the labor force, but we, we, we need to, pr to provide training programs to be ahead of all these opportunities. Thank so you. There, really, it's very important to not let culture and creative economy at the, 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 the end of every important subject we have to discuss, because it's part of the solution. Yeah, thank you for your comments, Neela. And it's uh, the comments that you're making, I think, amongst all the things you're saying, a lot of what you're saying is, well, you're starting out, you want to start from a strong foundation, because you said two things that have struck out, um, stuck out for me. One of them is that you just now mentioned the mentality is in the mindset. Mm -hmm. That is the, the mindset is pivotal. That's the foundation of everything. And in addition to the mindset, you mentioned previously about definitions. So what you're also speaking about is building this on building all of this on solid foundations of, like you said, mindset. And, uh, and of you also said, um, uh, in addition to mindset definitions, and from that everything can spring forth, forth and thrive because we're all starting from the same place and we all, we're all starting from the same place and from the same prism of thinking. And from that, that's when we can all seek partnerships. And as I mentioned before, we know what we're seeking partnerships for, what we're seeking partnerships, what we're not seeking partnerships for. But in it, um, that's the same, the same um, question to the rest of the panelists. Um, and that is again, just to repeat again, what can African governments and institutions do to create an even more supportive ecosystem for your creative industries to thrive? And again, this can be initiatives that you already know exist, or a wish list. I see Obi, you've joined us. Do you have a comment? If Obi Definitely. doesn't, then somebody... Definitely have a comment. Can you okay. Yes, we can, Obi, please. Yeah, no, I think I really enjoyed what um, the senator was just saying. I think that the first thing is for the Africans ourselves and African governments to put the African people first and foremost in everything they're doing. Because if you understand that the creative and cultural industries are the expression of the IP of the African people, then you understand why if you put that front first and forward, it will not be the last thing on the agenda, it'll be the first thing on the agenda. Yeah. I think that's really, really important. I think that if you look at Africa today, what are the big, big opportunities? It, a lot of people will talk about tech and innovation. The other side, they talk about the creative industries and the cultural community. And those industries are meeting together and bringing them together to converge and collaborate, I think is the big opportunity. So I think you can apply tech across all the spaces of the set of the economy, but the creative and cultural industries are the storytellers. Unfortunately, as we're sitting here in 2023, the net investment made into our creative economies is made more from outside the continent than within yeah. the continent by our governments or by the broadcasters yeah. on the continent. And that's what we need to change. So we can't have a situation where we're gonna be complaining about appropriation, about all these other things, when our own institutions, our own governments are not backing our own IP. We should not need to wait for Disney to turn the Orisha into gods in the future. We can do it ourselves. 
So I think this is really, really important to understand that power lies with us. The ability and the talent is here. Capacity building is enormously important. We need to skill up our people, probably to the tune of 10 million people a year for the next decade, just to skill them up with the digital skills and the, and the skills they need to take it beyond intuition to knowledge and process so they can deliver. And this is across all industries, not just the creative industries and cultural industries. But for me, the most important thing is for the governments of Africa to, for the first time, back African IP, back African ideas, African innovation, African storytelling, because that is what will actually change the narrative. When you talk about changing the narrative, you haven't invested in the narrative, so how can you change it, right? Where are the African originals? Why do we have to wait for Netflix to give us originals? Let us fix our domestic television markets. Let's fix our domestic, and let's create television markets in our countries, and let's build commercial. We have the buying power. We have the advertising networks, and we have the content that can travel anywhere in the world. That's what we believe. When there were no social media platforms, there was no access, we already did it before. So now that there are platforms and tools, and you've got the mobile phone, which is the most disruptive piece of technology in the world, AI is upon us. So for me, that's the other thing that Africa has to pay attention to. We don't have any investment or any, or any African ID and African um, DNA is not yet in AI. Our languages, our culture, our history, our heritage, we are outside that frame and we need to be in the frame. Otherwise, we'll be chasing the next 500 years just as we yeah. chasing the last 500 years in terms of narrative. So I think that when, when African politicians and leaders think about narrative and think about politics, it is actually the storytellers that determine the narrative. And if you don't invest in the storytellers, you always play on the defensive. So let's play with the front foot, invest in our own stories, and understand that Shango came before Thor, the Greek gods and the, and the Roman gods came after the African gods. And yeah. let's start with our own stories. Yeah, yes, you absolutely, you absolutely can react. Yes. Yes, please. very, very quickly. Yeah. Because what, what? I, I mean, said. yes. Let's give Obi a round of applause because I think his yeah, comments are absolutely yeah. brilliant. Thank, brilliant. thank you, Obi. We've only got like ten minutes just, left. Just so very yes. quickly, because uh, yeah, I'd like to hear the rest of the panel. It, it, just that he was talking about artificial intelligence because yeah. we, we of course, are very far from being aware globally in Africa of the impact of what is happening in the United States, for example, and all the, the strikes that were happening in Hollywood because of the use of artificial, artificial intelligence. And P said something that is really, you know, resonates in my mind. She said, we don't want to be perfect. We want to stay authentic. And I think very rapidly that this is very important to keep in mind that we can create a creative economy by being who we are, and this is what we have to do actually, because this is why we are so inspiring for the rest of the world. And I think we'll be more and more inspiring because we are authentic, we are who we are, we preserve our tradition that are inspiring for their, our creators, and we have to be very much aware of what is happening in the rest of the world to not do the same mistakes. Yeah, progress beats perfection. Yes. Um, I, I love everything that obviously Kern yourself was saying. I, I think it was very key points. I think if we do though look at Hollywood, um, this is an industry that has basically generated over $500 billion by them just doing all of the things that you've said and Obi has said. Um, and if we zoom into the state of Atlanta, where they've decided to actually invest intentionally in the creative economy, he's managed to generate revenue of over $4 billion. Yeah. So if we now do that in terms of the African continent, what we're able to do is unmatched. But I, as a former teacher, would also like to look at the roots of our creative economy. If you look at the creative economy that exists in Africa right now, it's a product of a lot of really, really strong minds that are saying, we want our stories to change. We want the world to pay attention to us and we'll do it. Even if we don't have the institutions that back us, even if we don't have necessarily government bodies, even if we don't have the investment, we'll find a way. So if we're able as a government body or as a state or as an institution or as a, a wood, shall I say, that will say, we're gonna invest in our youth. Let's educate the African youth so that when you have all these subsets, whether it's fashion, whether it's 
media, whether it's TV, film, presenting, and all the different spheres that are taking over the world and demonstrating our narratives on a global arena, if we have those subsets that are lined up with educated young people that are being fed into each of those verticals, what we'll be able to produce will be unmatched, because right now you're seeing raw talent in action. And we have a right to have a superiority complex, as you said, because if we're able to do this without the systems and structures of Hollywood, what happens if we start arming our youth with the ability, the talent, the skill set on a global scale to compete on a global scale? Because the Africa we're celebrating that are collecting Grammy Awards, BET Awards, box office hits are doing it without the infrastructure. So I believe as a former teacher, the youth as well is extremely key and arming them with the right education, the right resources, the right connections is what will really make a lasting impact yeah. to our creative economy and to also the world paying attention to us for the long term. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that piece. Incredible comments. Mm -hmm. um, George, you keep on looking at me, so. Well, I, I, I want to highlight some, of, some things that I've seen across the continent that can be used as models um, for growing this homegrown, um, magical industries. And can you share those in, in less than a minute before we have to wrap up? Yes, yes. in less okay. than a minute. I'm, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing some uh, uh, posters of countries uh, for, on the seats. Okay, yes. Yeah. Su some examples from these posters. A country like Rwanda, um, as small as it is, um, they've decided to be courageous and protect their fashion signature by doing simple things like reducing uh, import substitution of secondhand clothing from Europe and, and right. uh, Australia, which uh, by extension creates sort of like a breathing space for uh, domestic um, uh, companies to be competitive locally. If you look at, uh, at a country uh, like um, Kenya, um, we are a film destination. Uh, but we are fixated about old models of uh, film that we want Kenya to be a film destination where we give incentives to Europeans to reduce their cost of filming instead of reinvesting that money back in local ecosystems and creating quotas on uh, uh, public broadcasting. A um, country like Tanzania uh, is a powerhouse in music and in food, um, but they are... But <laughs> But they are fascinated about um, tourism instead of um, creating a McDonald's chain of uh, pilau or jollof. Um, uh, Ethiopia, uh, they are the and largest. Ethiopia could be your last example. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I can go on and on, but Ethiopia are the largest exporters of uh, leather and soft top leather that goes into all our gloves and our shoes. But we don't have any green tanneries. Uh, in Ethiopia. So what I'm trying to say is that we have some models, but we're not strategic about uh, um, how to use the few resources that we have strategically to, to, to push our agenda and to increase our unique selling point. And so, talking about being strategic and strategic with, strategic with resources, we have less than three minutes left. So I want to be strategic with uh, an incredible resource that we have called Time. And I'd like to do a fire round, and I'd like to start with Valerie. If you could do a final fire round, and I honestly mean 30 seconds per panelist, um, starting with you, Valerie. Um, is there anything you'd like to share with the audience as a takeaway when the audience is thinking about Africa Creative Industries? In 30 seconds, each panelist, what would you like our audience to think about? You can start with you, Valerie. Alors, moi, ce que laisser... Is to leave, leave. Uh, as a lesson is, is to encourage our young creators to to uh, support them uh, to let them do what they want to do have to do and to give our governments the opportunity to support them as well in europe so they can come to europe to come to europe and be creative and do what they have to do to support them to give them the resources they need so that when they return home then they will have those uh, those tools and resources to take back home with them and that re requires government support as well actually support and training is what i'll sum up valerie saying thank you for that valerie neela in 30 seconds what would you like the audience to take away when uh, 
when you're thinking about how to contribute to the growth of Africa, Africa's creative industries? Well, I'd like to say that uh, the, the, the population of Africa is growing and everybody knows that it's the future. So we have to keep in mind that 70% of this population is under the age of 30. So our youth, we're all talking about future generations, are more and more attracted to culture and creative industries, in which are also part of you know scaling up the the mentalities and uh, you know br bringing more better education globally for our youth to prepare them to a more global vision of the world and also preparing the world to be a better place. So we have to we have to move on to the next step and please uh, just transform all these talks into concrete actions and not just talk about I, bankers and you know financial the financial world about how to to what we should do but just to do it and we've actually run out of time so um unless peace and george can say something in less than 10 seconds i would try to i just want to highlight that um i sit here as a former teacher who just wanted to see a different africa projected globally so whether you're in the banking sector, whether you're even a receptionist, your ability to engage in Africa and celebrate and share the content that is being created, whether it's even forwarding an Instagram post or a WhatsApp message like my mother always does, um, you're actually contributing to a new African narrative being pushed out. Our creative economy is growing and it is a force to be reckoned with, but it takes multiple drops like yourself in your respective industries just to show interest, to engage and to share the great things that we are producing from our continent, whether it's in music, fashion and all the like. So please, I encourage you, just keep promoting positive African narratives and together I believe we can make an, a substantial change for future generations to continue being proud of our continent as we all are. Thank you, and I think that's the perfect place to end. Can you please give our, all these panelists a fantastic round of applause? I, I think one of the things that we take away, and that I certainly take away, especially from Peace's final comments, is that we all have our respective echo chambers. And in those respective echo chambers and spheres of influence, let's make sure that we are sharing positive stories, that we are sharing positive initi initiatives, and that we are also opening up to allies and advocates to walk this path with us. So thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.